Hi guys, uh, welcome back to another session with the team from the last grade first and discussing their, their pending Antarctica crossing. Um, my name is John and I'm here with uh, Gareth and Richard. Hi guys, how are you doing? Hey John, good thanks. Hey John, yeah great, thank you. Good to be back. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we've been touching on some really interesting in topics in the past few weeks, but I think what we're getting on to now is the, the part that everybody gets really excited about, and that's all the, the fancy toys and the new things that you get to take with you to the ice and on every project that we do. So um, let's delve straight into equipment. Um, obviously, uh, we, we've discussed clothing and, and stated how the clothing is very different for the environment that you guys will be um, managing the expedition in, essentially with Antarctica being a white desert. But... Um, we see on, on websites and, and by talking to people, they refer to uh, the sleds that you pull behind you as polks. So could you guys maybe start there as to what, what is a polk? Why is it a polk? And, and what is its use for your expedition? So to cross Antarctica, you know, in 110 days covering 2,600 kilometers, it's a lot of stuff that we need to take with us. So probably somewhere in the realms of 400 kilos worth of stuff. And so the only way you can really do that on an unsupported, you know, human powered expedition is to, is to put it in sleds or, or pulks. Um, so we've spent a huge amount of time um, researching the best and most efficient um, type of sled for this, for this crossing. And I think, um, as Gareth says, the, the amount of equipment, predominantly food and, and fuel for, for keeping yourselves warm and, and melting snow and ice for water, um, it, the, the enormous weight of those things that you have to carry is a, is a, is a key feature of polar expeditioning and is, it is probably one of the most unique features of, of people who are traveling through the polar regions. So ever since the early days of polar exploring and, and, and prior to, to Western people um, getting involved in Arctic or Antarctic exploration, it's something that, that First Nation people in, in Arctic environments have, have, have relied on, um, is the idea of putting all your gear, far too much gear for you to ever carry on your back, putting all your gear in, in a sled basically, um, and pulling it along behind you, because it's simply just a lot of an easier way of doing it and the one bonus about being in a polar environment is that everything is slippery you're on this permanent patch of snow and ice and and, and snow and ice is to a lesser or greater degree smooth and slippery and you can pull sleds along it and i'm sure everybody's seen pictures of those those early explorers um using a variety of sleds, whether they're pulled by dogs or pulled by people, um, loaded down with, with huge amounts of supplies. And that's essentially still how you travel through the, through the polar regions today. And we're doing the same thing with just some more updated and modernized equipment. Yeah, and, and taking that one step further, um, you know, across the, across the whole route, we're going to be looking at really varying um, conditions. So across the, the Ross Ice Shelf to start with, we're expecting deep, deep, quite, uh, quite soft snow, um, which is a completely different prospect um, to drag a sled through than, um, than the hard pack snow and ice of the, um, of the polar plateau. Um, so we're looking very closely at, um, at how sleds are designed and how they travel over different surfaces and at different temperatures. Um, so, you know, one very heavy 200 kilo sled um, may, may be much harder to move through, through deep soft snow than, say, two sleds dragged in tandem uh, that, that spreads out surface area. But then maybe the friction or drag coefficient of two sleds, um, you know, counteracts that. And, uh, and so these are all the things that we've been looking at and, uh, and putting that together with, you know, what's the best type of sled to drag through crevasse terrain um, and all those sorts of things. So, um, so there's a lot of work looking at um, 
different um, different sled designs, but not only you know the designs, but the composition of the sled and the materials that they're made out of. I think I think that's a very interesting point. Is that when you think of Antarctica, you think of this flat white expanse of ice and snow, and and I know I, I've when I've been on a ski, if you put your feet down on the ski, you just start moving in whatever direction the slope is. Of course, obviously it's a it's a slippery surface. And when we've done some mountaineering with crampons, those are amazing. You kick in and your feet stay where they're supposed to be on the ice. But um, f for your expedition, your terrain is varying. The sled is obviously being pulled through all of that. But how how does it connect to you? And then also how how are you actually moving forward with skis? Because you've got a 200 kilogram sled behind you. Surely that's going to pull you backwards at some points, um, move you sideways. Um, how, how are you moving forward on a slippery surface with uh, essentially planks connected to your feet? That, that's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, a very fair point. Yeah, so, so look, we, um, the, the skis that we'll be using are quite different to your classic downhill alpine skis that a lot of people will be familiar with. And they're much thinner, they're much longer. And, and really, to be honest, the way to think of them is as very efficient snowshoes. So what they're there to do really is to stop you digging into the snow or, or, or to your feet sinking into snow. Um, and so it's all about spreading your weight over any sort of soft surface. Um, when, with particularly with polar trips where you've got large heavy sleds, if you can imagine, I don't know if people are, are very familiar with um, sort of telemark skiing, cross country skiing, where people with nothing behind them or something very small behind them can slide and glide. And that's the beauty of using skis, um, is in theory you can slide and glide. And for every foot movement, you're getting lots of extra distance of your feet sliding over, uh, of your skis sliding along the snow. Now, with a huge sled behind you, that doesn't happen. Um, and so really the skis are there most of the expedition and um, to function effectively as snowshoes. Later in the expedition, um, particularly if there's a little bit of a gradient going down, we might get a bit of glide and that would be fantastic because as soon as you can get a bit of glide, you can cover much greater distances. Um, and to go back to your question about uh, how do we stop ourselves? Why don't we just skitter with, a, with a, the skis going like this with a big sled dogging the snow behind us? Yeah. And essentially we use things called skins. So, um, uh, skins are uh, a fabric of, of various different types that sit underneath your ski um, and have hairs on them that only bend in one direction. So if you slide your ski forwards, the, ski, the, 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 um, the hairs are all bent backwards and the ski slides forwards. But when your foot tries to move backwards, all those heads flip down and dig into the snow and stop your ski slipping backwards. Um, and so we will be using long, thin cross-country skis um, or cross-country light skis uh, with skins underneath. So that we can actually use them to gain traction and haul our sled along forwards. And uh, a lot of um, a lot of work's been put into the type of skins, and um, and so you can get um, natural fibre skins and synthetic skins. And you've got to we're very conscious of weight, obviously, for the ex for the entire length of the expedition. So everything we take we take needs to be very durable. Um, so, you know, we only really want to have, you know, one or two sets of skins. So the choice is, the choice is really key on the, on the type of skin that we, that we take. We've been also looking very closely about, you know, the different parts of the, the expedition and, and the type of skins that we will need for each part. So, for example, as we're ascending from the, the Ross Ice Shelf up through the Transantarctic Mountains and we're going up quite a steep gradient, dragging such a heavy sled it'll be very important to have full length ski skins so skins that cover the entire bottom of the the, the ski so you can get such um, so you can get really strong traction with every step now that's very different to the to as rich said to the you know the the second half of the expedition where our sleds are a, a lighter um, and we may have a downhill gradient so we'll, we'll be looking to to uh, um, to pick up some glide and to, to go further every day. Um, so then we might be looking at maybe a shorter skin that doesn't, um, uh, or a shorter or thinner skin. And these are all the things that we're trialing in our, in our, in our training um, to see which ones are most efficient. 
to think that so much thought and technology and advance goes into into something as simple as as your ski um or your skis and on, on on that note your your harnesses and traces that are connecting you as the explorers to your faults um how, how does that work do they vary in length depending on the terrain as your skis would vary depending on the terrain you're moving through or um or are they just the standard length and and you're just using them to pull the faults So that's a, yeah, it's a really good question, and it's and like like everything that we talk about equipment wise, there's there's quite a lot of subtlety to it, and um, a lot of work and research to get it just exactly right. Um, I guess put simply, we'll be wearing um, harnesses that that try and put the most of the weight through our hips and our waist, um, with lots of padding, because as people I'm sure can imagine, 2,600 kilometers of rub and wear and tear on your on your waist and on your hips uh, is a very significant amount. We've got to be very careful that we uh, that we have very comfy and uh, harnesses and that we don't you know rub holes in our hips or anything. Um, and, and that essentially connects to a sort of shoulder setup that you try and minimize how much weight goes through your shoulders. Um, and then you have a thing called your traces, which are the, the, the bits of, of rope that connect um, us to our sleds. And as you mentioned, the, the length of that can be very variable. Um, and um, we might sometimes, for example, when we're moving through complicated or crevassed terrain, uh, crevassed terrain, want to have short traces so that the sleds are quite close behind us. Um, but in other, dis other sorts of environments, we might want to have long traces. Um, and, there's, and there's some quite interesting sort of design features of those traces themselves. They've always got to have a kind of dynamic element to them. If you've usually got to have a piece of strong elastic built into the system. Um, because otherwise a natural swaying of your body and your hips from side to side as you move along makes your sled do this in your path behind you which is very inefficient as people can imagine and can mean that you and if there's, there's this variation in the speed that you're moving your, you and your sled can be doing this relative to each other and can that can put a huge amount of strain on your back so you have this elastic system built within the traces that tries to even all of that out so your 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 sled moves in as straight a line as possible um, and the force that's applied to your hips and your waist is as constant as possible. So you could you could almost have a speed wobble on the ice with your with the trailer <laughs> that you hitched behind you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, John. <laughs> I, I wish I wish we were going that fast. <laughs> So uh, from, from previous expeditions, I know that expedition life can become very um, repetitive and you have your systems that you need to go through. You know that your tent needs to be pitched in this way. Um, and it's those little things that are, are the repeats that you get into a rhythm to, com to do and complete your day. And I think this, this might be the one thing that there is no repeat to, because you're going to have to be interpreting the environment the entire time, changing the skis, changing the lines, lengths, uh, almost almost like navigating. It's something that will be a continuous thing for you guys to be engaged with as, as you go along on your route. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, um, you know, we're, we're also um, um, considering in terms of the type of skis that we take, um, potentially taking, you know, different types of skis uh, to depending on the terrain, you know, different strengths, dif different lengths, different, um, you know, different, uh, different designs and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, in an unsupported crossing like this, where skis are so critical, we'll certainly be taking at least one spare pair. Um, it's just whether we go that one step further and take one, um, you know, two pairs each of, of differing pairs for differing for differing terrains, um, and we're factoring all that into the amount of weight that we can carry. But uh, but we're, we're thinking it may be maybe the best way to go. Hmm. So then I guess from from the external of what what we can see if we're this year, look at a photograph of you guys in the ice, to the internal of what is actually hidden inside that bulk. You mentioned earlier that um, food, it, it makes up almost 200 kgs of equipment. So food and stoves, um, I guess sleeping bags, your, your extra clothing, all the rest. But um, if we can work from the outside in, once you've opened that pulk and you start setting up your campsite, um, what is going up? We, we, we have spoken about the tents a little bit before, but if we can elaborate more on, 
on that and and then what else is coming out of there how do you cook you can't you can't carry um 50 60 liters of fuel in a jerry can for instance um they they obviously need to be in specialized containers so that that, that container can shrink and expand with the heat and the the cold of the arctic environment or antarctic environment um yeah if you guys can just expand a bit more around that that would be amazing so to be um to be as efficient as we can be on this trip uh, our tent will essentially be um partially assembled uh the whole time so and it will be essentially just taken down rolled up and put on top of uh, our pulks as we as we drag it along so as soon as we stop um at the end of the day it'll take us very little time indeed to uh to actually get the tent up um and they, and they're, des there. they're designed specifically for that or are you just opting to do that no, we're, we're opting to do that. And uh, there are certain modifications that we're, we're taking a, a Hilleberg tunnel tent. Um, and there are certain modifications that we will do to it personally to, to personalize it to, to what we need. Um, and a lot, a, lot, a lot of those things will be, you know, things like taking, taking the inset netting out. We don't really need that in the, in the polar regions and, um, and then modifying it so it's easily collapsible and easily put up uh, you know and there are there are lots of different things you can do to the t to the tent to make it uh, extremely efficient to put up and i think it goes and you know again because you're, you're traveling in such a unique way with having these big sleds behind you um you can you can do things that you wouldn't be able to do with through any other form of travel so as gareth says we'll, we'll only very partially disassemble the tent every day it, it will be rolled flat and it could be really you know it could be you know, really quite long, far longer than it could be if it had to fit in a rucksack. Um, um, and, and, that, and those little things can make a big difference to how quick and easy it is to put the tents up. So like, for example, we'll leave the tent holes threaded through the sleeves on the, on the, on the, on the tent so that we're not constantly trying to fiddle small, small um, poles through little holes with great big mittens or, have that, or even worse, have that temptation to take a, a glove off and do it with your bare hands because that would be potentially disastrous. Um, and so uh, everything will be left essentially with a, a tent that's just flattened and rolled up and then put straight on top of the tent. And that's the beauty of traveling in a polar environment. You, you can do things like that. And then once, once your tent's up, um, there's obviously a, a, a grounded floor that's stitched into it. You're putting your gear out inside from your pulk. Your pulks would stand next to your tent as a, as a windshield, I would assume. Um, but what what actually what does your tent look like on the inside? Just sleeping bags, uh, and what what makes your sleeping bags different to the ones that we would go buy in the shops, as an example, for a camping trip? So just starting with um, you know when when we get the tent up, the, the whole process is um, you know has to be really systematic and well drilled because the whole expedition is geared towards efficiency. Um, so we as soon as we finish skiing. Everything that we do needs to be, you know, put towards being being ready to ski at our at our best the following day. So that means getting the tent up and inside and and resting and eating as soon as possible. Um, so once so both of us will will help put the tent up, but then the the, the cook for the day will um will chuck. It's their job to throw all the gear into the tent and set the inside of the tent up, um, and the person who's not the cook. Um, we'll be outside cutting snow blocks ready for us to um, ready for us to, to melt the water to have dinner and, and drink some things and then once they've cut the snow blocks you know they'll, they'll finish arranging everything else out in the tent you know they'll put snow on the snow valences and they'll pack away the pulps and um, and then um, and then the, and then the person inside the tent will be setting up and, and getting the stoves on mm -hmm. and uh, Rich you want to talk about what's in the tent? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you can imagine that the first person that goes in the tent, the, the, the first thing they do is, is get the stoves up and they'll um, always have a little bit of water left in a flask and they can begin as soon as that first snow block is cut by the person outside the tent, they can start that, that melting process because obviously there's no liquid water for us so that everything that we use to drink and everything that we use to make to rehydrate all our, our frozen or dehydrated and frozen food, um, we need to melt from snow and ice. 
So as soon as that those ice blocks get put into the tent, the person who's the, the cook for the day will just get going with that cycle that lasts for several hours of an evening and in the morning of just melting snow, because huge volumes of snow are required to make quite small amounts of water. Yeah. So that's a constant process um, that happens as soon as you, you get down into the tent. Um, and then inside the tent itself, there'll be a, a kind of cooking area, the sort of vestibule of the tent, which will probably have a sort of board onto some snow, which will have the stoves on it. And that will be the really sort of cooking area. And the chef of the day will sort of sleep across or sleep closest to that bit. Um, and then um, the rest of the tents, there's a couple of ways of doing this. There'll be the ground sheets and you can potentially have a mat that covers the entire ground sheet um, with your sleeping mats on top of that. Or you could just have your sleeping mats and there's sort of pros and cons of, of which way you do it. But essentially we'll have at least two sleeping mats plus or minus a, a whole floor mat that'll try and keep the snow, uh, the, the tent, sorry, insulated, the floor of the tent insulated from the, the freezing snow or ice that's, that's just on the other side of that thin um, fabric ground sheet um, and then on top of that we'll go our sleeping bags um, and our, our sleeping bags are another one of these sort of absolutely vital key bits of equipment and and they need to be specialist sort of polar sleeping bags and um, that can keep us warm into these temperatures that we might experience down into minus anywhere between minus 10 and minus minus 30 um, uh, and they're you know they're, they're goose down sleeping bags that, that can cope with those sorts of temperatures um, and will be um, need to be well enough designed, well enough built to cope with um, how, you know subtleties of sleeping bag and tent design around moisture evaporation and condensation and all sort of rigors that go through them as they uh, as they have to deal with our body heat and the extreme cold on the other side of it. Um, and hopefully with the, those mats on the floor, the sleeping mats and our sleeping bags and the stoves going, the insides of the tents can actually become quite warm, quite cozy places. Uh, for us to spend a few hours in the evening. I was I was going to say yeah if you if you're melting snow for hours on end I'm pretty sure that the tent gets quite warm compared to the outside and it's quite a cozy little spot to be in. Yeah it's amazing really um, the, the tents are like um, like a survival cell you know you, you get it up in the in the harshest con conditions and you get inside and get your, and get your stoves on and soon you know the inside of the tent can be 25 degrees and it'll be and it can be minus 40 on the other side of a, just a very thin um bit of material so they're quite incredible things and um mm. you know both both rich and i quite like spending a lot of time in tents which is a good thing <laughs> and i think um yeah i mean that the way that sort of way Gareth said the survival cell and that's I mean there's no way that you could that humans can survive in the polar environment without a way of getting out of the elements and the conditions and, and it's your tent that allows you to do that so you know we'll be carrying this little this little tiny rolled up bit of fabric that we suddenly erect into a tent that you can crawl into and then then within that is this tiny little sort of few square meters of habitable environment in this vast hostile wilderness and without that couple of layers of, of fabric um, and a small little air gap between the two that can have a 40, 50 degrees centigrade gradient across it, um, it would be totally impossible for humans to survive. And, 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 and I, have, I personally think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, and every time I'm in a tent, all cozy and wrapped up and there's some wild Arctic storm outside, I, I think about that and I think it's, I think it's an incredible um, and really inspiring um, little fact. Yeah. And, and just to just to give everybody listening a, a reference, this isn't your family camping tent that you go away for the weekend. This tent is about a half a meter to a meter off the ground. Gareth and Richard are crawling around in it. It's definitely not uh, not your your weekend vacation tent that you guys are going to be spending 110 days in. Um, but as you said, it is it is your lifeline and your life survival cell for for the Antarctic. And then um, on that, like burning burning fuel. To, to cook and to get water, of course, that's something that you don't think about is that there's water all around you in the form of ice and snow, but there's no actual flowing liquid water. So you need to produce that for yourselves. Um, where, how are you carrying and calculating fuel for 110 days that you're gonna have to be taking with you? How, how does that work? Of course, your little, your little MSR bottle is about a liter in size, 750 moles. 
and um, I don't I don't think um, a hundred of those are going to go with you for the for the trip. No, look. So essential is essentially we, you know, we need to work out exactly how much water we're going to need to be melting. And Rich and I are going to have to be drinking about three liters of water a day, um, just when we're out skiing. Um, and then there'll be more water for meals, cups of tea in the tent. Um, and when you add all that up, that's a lot of that's a lot of snow that you have to melt every day. And and as Rich said, you know, it's what takes most of the time. So the person you know in charge of the the stoves in the evening and in the morning spend a lot of time melting snow so that's the most arduous task on the whole expedition and then taking from that you need to calculate how much fuel that we think we will need um to carry so um so there's a lot of um there's a lot of calculations to be done there and and then we need to work out how we're going to carry the fuel so as you say we're not going to take 100 msr bottles so um, we'll just take enough MSR bottles that we need to run the stoves and then every, all the other fuel would be carried in, um, in special fuel containers. And like everything else, um, it's an area that we've been drilling down on where to find the lightest, uh, most robust um, containers because you don't want to take the lightest container you can find that then it's going to break when the, when the, when the sled falls over a, a bit of sastrugi or something like that and then the fuel leaks through your your polk and ruins all your food and then that, that's it's a disaster so a lot of there's a lot of work that needs to be put into these these key bits of kit yeah so it's, and essentially that it, you know it comes down to as gareth says a, a, a calculation of, of mills per person per day times 110 um and and that's how much fuel you need with you and that and that you know, is to do with the type of stoves. We're taking some very well tried and tested um, sort of specific polar design stoves with us, um, and uh, uh, and and how much water we're going to need to melt for what for drinking water, but also for our food will be based on you know quite precise calculations with a bit of a uh, as with so many things in this expedition, you, you've got to have a little bit of um, running out of fuel is a total, a total disaster and will be the end of the expedition, but at the same time, you don't want to take too much spare fuel because every little bit of extra weight that you carry that you don't need jeopardizes the chances of success in itself. And, and, and that, that fundamental balance goes for fuel and food, and as, as we've said several times, every single part of the expedition. Oh, wow, that's incredible, and I think I think on that balancing act, I think we can we can call call us on a night and um, ask the guys to to tune in for the next discussion, where we expand a bit more around um, around the food and the nutrition and and actually what what you're taking with you for to to consume for the 110 day period. But um, again, guys, absolutely amazing. Um, learning about uh, the expedition, about the equipment that you're taking with and, and what you will be embarking on. Then. But thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks, John. And um, if you're interested in following the expedition, um, please visit our website, sign up to our newsletter, follow us on Instagram and all that good stuff. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, folks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>